Live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kaleidoscope of the Arts. And we're excited today. I'm Marie Labras, and I'm Didi Gozian. We are your hosts, and we have Philip Moore, Sergeant Philip Moore, with us today. And you're listening to WKDW 97.5 FM. Real Community Radio. We're coming out of Northport, Florida, and you'll be listening to us on the Bishop West Real Estate Tower. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today and listening. And Dee, Dee we want yes. to thank our sponsor of our show, NAMEC Portfolio Investment Spo Professionals, LLC. Tell me a little bit on how I would get a hold of our sponsor, Wendy NAMEC. Oh, Wendy NAMEC is uh, emailed at Wendy at namac.com. Um, Wendy mm -hmm. is a businesswoman who is at one time on our board at the Art Center. She now sponsors our radio show and her business, NAMAC Portfolio Investment Professionals, LLC. It's um, website www.namac.com and her phone number 941-429-2911. And we just want to do a shout out to Wendy because without a sponsor sponsoring people's show, and we are an all volunteer 501c3 nonprofit radio station. And for a lot of people, they don't realize that. And right now we're streaming on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and Twitter. So all of you out there that are taking time out of your busy day, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Well, enough with us talking, because I know we have a lot to get to with Philip. Bef but before we get with Philip, do you want to talk any bit about the Northport Art Center? What's happening? Well, uh, before we get into the Art of War and our um, special show, let's talk a little bit about the um, Kaleidoscope of the Arts Dinner that we're having because it's very important. We have um, it's open for ticket sales now on our website. It's uh, northportartcenter.org, O-R-G. And uh, the, the lineup is building. Marie is in our fundraising chair has been doing a beautiful job selecting all the talent that you will see that night. We have a wonderful dinner. The best dinner that the plantation has to offer will be um, available for every person who gets a seat. Marie, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Thank you for the lead in, Dee Dee, because the uh, price of the ticket is very reasonable. It's $85. What comes with that is a uh, intoxicating evening of discovery into the arts of Northport. And why are we doing this? Well, let me tell you, you may not know what's available in Northport in the arts. However, with the Northport Art Guild, which the Northport Art Center, they're, that's their umbrella, that's their 501c3, we've decided to create an event that we can give you a little sampling of what's here. And not only that, we have guests that are nationally known coming and performing who are from the Northport area. Iman Bisha, if you remember the America's Got Talent young gal that sang opera, she not only sings opera, she does everything else. And she's very talented and she, have been involved at the Northport Art Center. She was one of their yes. students. Yes. She will be one of the top headliners that we have. Little dang little there. And then Tammy Renee, and she just won for 2021 the top female singer song, songwriter, female artist of the year in the female uh, in the Christian music venue. But she's it's a country western. She sings all different types of variety. And she's had different albums out and has been, uh, she beats out the people like Dolly Parton and some of those people out there in those venues. So believe she it or not. She has a beautiful voice. I, I go on and listen to her voice. Look her up, Tammy Renee, on, on the internet. I was so impressed. She's a gorgeous Yeah, girl. and she's a lovely, lovely lady. And then we have the Rockbox School of Music and uh, 
yeah, School of Music and Stage. And um, in fact, he just reached out to me about something else that they want to do. And then also we have Common Grounds Meeting Hall and it's an eclectic group of musicians from around the country, but they're all only getting a little bit. So this is the event to be to. And just the Charlotte Players and and we have the Comf um, Comfenbergs, uh, which is Denise Berg and her group and they represent kind of like the the Northport leadership, I mean, Northport Chamber. Yeah. And instead of the leadership having an art night, they're coming to this event. The 2022 class is yeah. coming to this event, Kaleidoscope of the Arts, January 15th. Where? The Plantations Golf and Country Club. Why is it there? Because... Northport doesn't have a venue large enough to house an event like this. And we're gonna change that because we have to build a multi, multi-use multi facility that will house the virtual, visual arts. Yeah, virtual too. <laughs> virtual. Um, visual arts, um, performing arts, literary arts, and then also have a venue in there that we can have events like that. So Absolutely. enough with that. And be there or be square. And like Dee said, go to northportartcenter.org, purchase your tickets, and we'll see you. Doors Talk. open at 4.30. 4.30 to 9.30, yes. Because everybody likes to get home by 9.30 or 10. So that's, that's our goal. That's our goal. <laughs> it's going to be a really fun evening, though. Okay, enough about that. Well, you'll be hearing about that more and more and more in I just want to invite everybody because you'll get to meet all of us there too. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Thank you, Dee Dee. Okay. okay, let's let's move on because it isn't all about us. This is all about Philip Sergeant Philip S. Moore. And we're gonna talk about healing through art and yeah. how he came across uh, through his brilliant mind, how healing with art and the art of war became a reality. So let's have you guys take it away and I'm gonna give you the big screen here, kids. Thank you, Marie. Um, for everybody that's just tuning in, this is Sergeant Philip Scott Moore. Um, Philip is a part of our art center. He <coughs> has been a part of our art center for a couple years now. And um, he is one of the most giving people that we've ever had here. It's quite touching this entire story. Um, it's grown very fast and it was a it was a great idea at the beginning and and so many people have taken on um, and brought it ahead so fast and it's becoming a, a, a an amazing story actually. And um, Philip can you tell me when you first came to the art center, how long ago was it? Uh, it was just a, maybe a little over a year. A little over yeah. a year ago. Thanks for having me, by the way, you guys. Thank you very much. It's oh. a pleasure to be here. Oh, we're very proud to have you. Thank you. Um, Philip, whenever you first came to the Art Center, uh, what brought you here? Uh, my wife, and, and she pretty much was the person I had to drop off and pick up. Um, she shoved me into a class after a while, so I, I do remember sitting out in the parking lot and and that's what brought me here was her you know well, <laughs> the that's fact wonderful. that i had to be here to pick her up so. <laughs> and, and if anybody doesn't know who his wife is it's michelle moore the crazy puerto rican lady with the hair like this <laughs> and and she's a dynamite person to begin with i don't know how how you wouldn't have been drugged into a room event <laughs> <laughs> but, but there was no there's no way i was going to refuse it you know and the fact of the matter is uh, we needed a, a reason to get out of the house and get into our community together. Yeah. And so um, we pretty much just said, let's go have a date night. Let's go once a week and have a date night and give it a shot. That's wonderful. Yeah. And what did you do on your date night here? Well, we started with pastel classes and we literally took vacation out to the Smokies within a, just a few weeks of, of starting the class. But we had our pastels with us on the trail. We had paper on the trail and we were 
you know, just, just primitively sketching things and making little bushes and trees or sunsets. But uh, it was the passion was there with us the whole time. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, I also understand before we get into the story of um, the art that you've had prior art training experience. Is that true? Yeah. Yes. I, I dabbed a little bit with graphic design up to the point where I got to computers. Once I got to computers, I, I just lost it. I couldn't, you know, pay attention enough and sit the screen. I remember typography class. I, I didn't know what was so interesting about a little waft on a letter and let alone staring at a big screen to figure it out. Um, so I actually had all of the art background that I had before that in high school. And the earliest memory that I have is taking a summer writing class, a creative writing class in first grade. In so, first grade? In first grade. So, so I do recall always having a creative side. I remember in high school, I would very much rush through my projects, you know, while others were taking their time and, and being precise. Uh, but I, I always had a passion for it, most definitely for creative stuff. That's yeah. amazing. That's amazing. First grade. I mean, most kids are just learning to read it. <laughs> You're learning to write. You know what? I do remember whenever you had this interview that you had brought up something about writing that I thought was I'm not a writer, but I thought it was fascinating when you said about taking your challenge of taking this much information and making it in this much information. Can you repeat that part? Because I thought that was very uh, profound to something like me that doesn't write. The, the information is going to be there. However, we all can express it. So whether it's a thousand words or five, as long as we can effectively get that idea across, it's almost like a puzzle, like putting a puzzle piece together with just certain syllables. And it's not necessarily trying to minimize the syllables more as it is trying to be effective as you can with certain words that you can be effective with. Yeah, that was very interesting because I'm not a writer. So people could relate to you and the passion for creative writing by explaining that way, where I am a visual artist. And again, and you, I can explain what the passion of putting things on paper in a visual artist way is, but I could never understand that creative part. So that was I, interesting. I think if, if you wrote down in the steps of what you do for a painting, specifically your painting, mm -hmm. you'll find the passion there to creatively express that in words one way or another. I'm sure you'll be able to oh, find that's it out. so relatable. Yeah. Thank you. That was yeah. great. Yeah. And I didn't realize you were a literary artist also. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, well, Michelle's website, the Bone Boutique website, um, I wrote her bio for that, and, and it talks a little bit about her mom in relation to them and everything. And and so um, everything from the majority of, of things for the art of war to the descriptions of the paintings to the paintings that are at Welland Park right now, um, all of those descriptions I wrote. And Michelle tells me, hit them in the heartstrings, hit them where it hurts the most, right in the right in the heart. And well, every time I read you, it, I get choked then up. you wrote the article that's up on the website. Yes. Oh my! And I'm going to just tell everybody. I'm going to bring it up on the screen because I was blown away, and I'm going, "Oh, Michelle's a really good writer." It wasn't she, Michelle. Well, it was Phil. I'll Phil. tell you what. For 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 do her credit, she is becoming quite the writer because she. I'm kind of like her uh, her. Um, editor, so to speak, <laughs> but, but she's, but she is becoming quite the writer herself. And and a lot of people don't know that everything that has been written is, is refined between the two of us. But yeah, I, I wrote the majority of it. Well, you make a good team. And when I'm, when I was reading your story, Philip, and I'm sorry, Didi, I'm interjecting right here because I find it, find it very fascinating. Your background history uh, when I was looking at this, she joined the army at age 21 after for eight years serving in the 1st Cavalry Division. You were able to endure three combat deployments to Iraq from 2004 to 2010 before exiting the military. For one thing, Philip, I want to thank you for your service, for the sacrifices that you had to make because I personally know that most people that have gone through what you have come back with PTSD. And I, the next sentence here does say that you suffer from PTSD and you self, sought out help through prolonged exposure from a wonderful doctor named Joanne King out of Danville, Illinois, Virginia, 
Is that Virginia, Illinois, mm-hmm. Virginia? That's the name oh, of the VA. Let me, let me tell you real quick, Marie. Big shout out to her. Of anybody that sees this whole story in the entire world, big shout out to Dr. Joanne King. I don't. She retired, and I'm just trying to get a hold of her one more way. I got to get my information to that to that hospital in Danville, Illinois, to see if I can get a hold of her. Excellent, and and it does take a lot of people to help heal. Uh, oh, so many of you. Scheduling. Yeah, uh, it's very critical. Now let's talk a little bit about your experience, if you're willing to, uh, for for the audience, because it is. Uh, Veterans Day this week, and I know that you're going to be on uh, uh, on TV after this interview that we do right now. You'll be on Fox News. That's right, yeah. Fox, Fox 13 out of Tampa, and it'll be at 5 p.m. Yeah. yeah. And for any of you uh, that is listening that does get Fox News on Channel 13 out of Tampa, I advise you to just, and I encourage you to tune in and see the story with Philip there because they are in his home when they're doing that. And you're having a watch party at the art center, correct? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I'm not going to be there because I'm here doing this. I'm at home. Uh, let's talk a little bit, Philip, how it all came up. Uh, you know, you're suffering from PTSD, but what did you find out when you were going into the service that you weren't aware of? And I find this another thing that's fascinating. You're colorblind. Yeah. Yeah. And I can start with that because uh, that's when I actually found out about how colorblind I was. So those little bubble tests that you do with all the little circles and numbers that you have to see the number. I only got two out of 15 of them right. I distinctly remember there was no way I was seeing those. And so they said, well, we're going to have to call somebody about this in medical and you're going to have to get a waiver just to get into the army. And the big deal about differentiating colors in the military is being able to see on a map what's water <laughs> yeah, and what's land. So, so that was a big deal. And so they said, lucky for me that I had a flashlight with a lens that would be able to bring out the specific colors. So um, being colorblind, it's been a struggle through art because I've through through college and at Parkland College after the military, I needed to do everything according to exactly how the picture was. And and I was furiously um, chasing after a GPA that I wanted to maintain as far as grades and and um, luckily that they were very receptive to the fact that I was colorblind. So um, I, I fought through it as far as painting goes, but now I'm just trying to just go along with it as much as I can. And what are you finding out when people like Dee Dee or Michelle who are not colorblind, when they look at your work, because I, I bought one of your calendars oh, and, and it's amazing work. I, Dee Dee, what are you seeing? Because you're a visual artist. What are you seeing different from what Philip is seeing out there that you've been able to see? That's really interesting that you say that, Marie, because Philip's work is so dynamic because of his color blindness. Uh, those of us that see color very well, we're always trying to interpret the colors that we see, and it might make things muddy looking. It might make things. We're, we're trying to strive to see the color to match the color that we see. In Philip's case, he is actually creates the energy that the colors are making next to each other and he can explain that a little bit better but his uh work is so much more dramatic the 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 brights are so much brighter the the shadows are so much darker it's um it's actually very beautiful i think it's genius compared to the colors he chooses aren't about the colors that we're seeing the colors he chooses is about the energy that the colors are showing on the paper for him so it, it's a it could become an unusual color combination but it works and it's and it's very um stunning many yeah, other pieces are yeah i'll bring up some of that up on the screen so Excellent. people can yeah. see what we're talking about and Philip, maybe you can explain to us what we are seeing here. Yeah, yeah. What you're looking at is just different thumbnails, pictures of some of the the 
different photos or, or paintings from the calendar that I produced. So these are all scenes from photos that I took in Iraq over three different deployments. Okay. Um, when we're over there, we can't tell the, the bad guys to just take a time out for a snapshot. So the moments that were captured were distinctly captured for the specific reason to be able to share uh, with people back home and let people know that, that, you know, not all of it is just gore and war and, and blood and tears. And uh, some of the, the captions behind these photos are, are um, very uh, well worded and very relatable to people who have never served or been overseas. So everybody can understand exactly what's going on in all of these. And as I'm looking at these pictures, you're right, Dee Dee, the brilliance of the different colors, uh, because it is, uh, you're right, there's energy in these pictures. When I'm looking at them on the screen, and I do have the calendar, and I have to be the first to admit I haven't opened it yet because I've been busy, but um, I have it. And I, okay. and I encourage people. You got a whole year to look at it, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you. <laughs> but, but how would anybody even purchase something like this? Well, you can go to the Northport Art Center website, northportartcenter.org, and you can look up Art of War, okay, in the drop-down selection menu. All right. Um, also, there's a QR code on, on the flyer, I believe, and people have been using the QR code as far as that. That'll take you directly to this particular website. And there's a little button that says shop now. So if you already have a calendar or you've already purchased 10 or 20 for Christmas gifts, um, there's also a selection to be able to donate as well. So a lot of folks say, well, I have a calendar already or I don't use a calendar you know, but I'd like to be able to donate. There's an actual option to donate whatever you'd like as well. And some people have been doing a combination of both, which is yes. great, which is which is very, very thoughtful. And, and let's talk about the money uh, that's coming in, because this is really critical for a lot of people to know uh, what your goal is by creating this and healing through art with PTSD and Take it away, Philip, because we want the people to know that you have a goal there. Yes. Um, can I wanted to start at the beginning of that part of the story because Michelle challenged Philip. Philip talked earlier about starting in pastel classes, and Michelle challenged him at home since they were both doing this together about creating creating art by at a, at a jar. And go ahead and so, tell her the rest of the story. So we needed a, a reason to at least paint every day. You know, we've learned that, that once we're doing this, we're not going to wait for one week for a class or, or every in between. So we were painting every day. She said, well, you know, find a reason to paint every day. Maybe you can paint a picture that you've already taken. We've learned that taking photos, it's an original painting. Nobody else will have it. So I said, well, I've got a lot of photos from overseas. Let me see if I can at least sketch that and see. And so she was joking around when she said, well, you know, I could get you your own show, maybe. Ha ha ha. So this was back in April of this past year. And so I said, well, I'll do maybe a couple paintings a month and take my time. And I think by the end of uh, maybe September, I had 18 paintings all whipped out and, and ready for the framers. They were sprayed with final fixative and they were covered and tucked away in a safe spot and, and um, right now they are sitting safely framed, but it was a reason for us to paint. And I didn't know that uh, this process of going through these past emotions uh, during the process of some of these paintings, I was smelling gunpowder. Um, I was hearing explosions. I was crying. It's going back and forth between the canvas and the photo. Um, and it was something that uh, that it was a vocational rehabilitation. Uh, the, the creativity was there. I guess maybe the the, the artistic ability might have been there, but um, the emotional release had not yet been established. So now that it's there, um, I've already I'm already ahead seven paintings for the next calendar. <laughs> so so I, I might have to, to you know just hold off on that for a while and, and really just um, focus more on on this being a community effort 
for this program. So as uh, Phil was saying that he created these uh, paintings um, at Michelle's uh, insistence that they paint all the time, and he ended up having an emotional experience, an emotional experience that um, helped him in his healing process. So Philip being a very generous and kind person, one of the most generous and kind persons had developed this program that he would create a calendar and we would have a one man show. And with the proceeds that he received from his calendars that he would donate it to a program that other veterans that were suffering could also get art classes and be on a path of healing as uh, Philip did, which actually blends beautifully with the, um, with the mission of our nonprofit. And we, our mission is igniting inner emotion and outward excitement for the arts, promoting cultural development and sharing the healing power of self-expression through art exhibitions and education. And Philip has embodied everything that our mission is about. I am so proud of him sharing his story. So happy that the art center could be part of Philip's story. And he is the most unselfish person to create this program for other veterans to um, participate at no charge to them that this will um, scholarship will be available to anybody that applies and the applications are also available on the website um, under art of war at the same place you can purchase calendars you can be a veteran and apply and we've had um, we've had an application already and it hasn't even started I'm very proud of that too so um, if anybody out there would like to apply as a veteran, Philip has developed a, a wonderful program. He will support each veteran that um, comes through the program fully. It, it's about a healing process, not just about an art class, which which is also quite amazing. So Philip, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Um, so, so basically what it's designed to be, um, you don't have to be a fine artist. Uh, you don't have to come out and express your entire story or get in front of a bunch of people. Um, it's another tool in the tool chest for, for coping. And when I first got with Michelle, she read about PTSD and found out that as many outlets that you can have, the better. Because um, there's always going to be triggers. Things are going to trigger you all the time, whether it's a memory, whether it's a sound or a smell or somebody saying some phrase or anything. Um and, and so to have as many outlets as possible, it's vital to be able so you're not trapped to where you feel like there's no way out and you're never going to talk about it to anybody. And, and, and if you can uh, write it on a, a piece of paper every day, if you can sling a paint balloon against a canvas and feel great about it, if you can take an old picture and uh, make a rubbing of it or, or just take a photo of, of it, another photo and anything like that, that, that would... Um, really be a coping mechanism. This is what it's designed to do. And I'm, I'm not a fine artist at all, but I enjoy learning about it and taking my mind off of things to be able to uh, put my efforts into something that, that can be very emotional on the other side and to share with others. Cause I really don't think beauty is, is realized until it's shared. As you're talking about that too, Philip, you are a good artist. You may not think so. Look at Whistler's mother. She didn't start creating until she was in her 70s. And I'm glad that you're talking about this because there is no limit to what art is in somebody's mind and the healing power of it. In fact, I saw that my husband's watching. I'm able to sometimes look and see who's watching us right now. And he and I were just talking about this because he's going through some health issues. And I said, you know, I think you may want to take a class, you know, just to help you with, and it's a healing thing. It's uh, art is healing. You don't have to be the best artist in the world. You don't have to do that, but to create, to feel that you have a purpose of doing something and to express emotion including with children. Art is one of the best ways that children can learn how to express themselves. 
if you've ever gone through, and I don't know, Philip, if you've ever seen when, um, when psychiatrists work with children, they do it in a playful way. They have them either draw or they'll uh, have a sandbox there that they're, they're expressing themselves. It's a matter of how you can express yourself. And as you're talking about this, war, you know, freedom isn't free. And what you went through, how are you feeling now out there healing people, helping others? Well, the, when Michelle first and I got together, when, she, when we first got together, she asked me, what do you want to do? Like, what kind of work do you want to do? And, and so realistically, um, I just told her, I, I just want to continue helping people. And it's, it's you know, uh, um, all the news channels didn't show us sitting in somebody's backyard protecting their neighborhood overnight for them to bring us fresh fruit and hot tea to make sure that we're okay and setting up hospitals for a whole day taking care of thousands of people or giving out thousands of backpacks to kids at schools you know the media didn't cover that um so i i'm i feel very grateful to be where we are i think we have it very good here um sometimes i get a little perturbed at, at people expressing how ungrateful they are and but I can make the decision to walk away from that. And that's not necessarily their fault of how they were raised or if they're just oblivious to certain things. Um, I, it used to trouble me a lot to be home because I felt like a stranger at home. Uh, you know, but it's up to me to be able to find things that are relatable to just average, regular civilian type type people that can't relate to what I've been through. I'm not going to hold that against somebody. So it's up to me to, to be relatable to others. Somehow. I want to I circle back to what you were saying, because you're right. The media doesn't cover those things. And that's one of those things that even though we're media right now on media, tell me some of those things that you did overseas. And you were saying handing out backpacks to thousands of children. And we never hear of that. So, so we have metal containers, shipping containers, full of donations from the states, whether it be churches or toy stores, whether they, they were backpacks, stuffed animals, clothing, lots and lots of things that, that we take for granted or that we have 16 of and could really only need two. Um, and, and it was a lot of winning hearts and minds. The first time I was over there, was right after Saddam Hussein was captured. So the fact that he was gone, yeah, and we were still there, not very many people were happy about that. So it wasn't necessarily always gunfire and explosions. It was trying to, to let the locals know that we're not there to, to provoke things. We're there to try to make things better for them and their kids especially. And I imagine that was really hard to watch at times and to deal with. Sure. Uh, how, uh, yeah. You were in uh, in full gear over there, and it gets over the hundreds, doesn't it? Oh, I, I, I think I got a good photograph uh, of a thermometer saying 130. Yeah. And, and being here in Florida, um, I'm acclimated to, if it's anything above 80, we all just kind of retreat inside. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but basically, I, it's still, I, I can't think back of, of how we really endured it with long sleeves and long pants and heavy equipment for hours and hours. And sometimes the majority of the weight was just the water that we had to bring with us to drink. And I imagine the gear that you had to take with you, and you're talking about with the water. Uh, water is such, a lot of people here in the States take it for granted. But fresh water, and I know because we were in the water industry, only 3% of the water on Earth is fresh, and only 1% of that water is accessible. And when you're in areas, even though it may have been fresh at one time because of pollution and, and what goes into the water, it may not be palatable. Our bodies, and is that something that you saw over there that diseases and different oh. things had come through because of not having clean access, uh, access to clean drinking water? Sure, sure. Now the trick, now the trick that, that I've seen overseas that they do often is they boil everything. Yeah, but um, I've seen uh, canals that, that had people 
bathing and doing their laundry and going to the bathroom and also had dead animals in the same canal. Um, so if that's what they're limited to, then, then, then that's what they have to do, whether they filter it or strain it or boil it, whatever they have to do. I know they all drink a lot of tea. They all drink a lot of chai over there. <laughs> so, and it's, it's 130 degrees and yet the, the tea is scalding hot. So I'm sure that's the reason why. Um, so, but, uh, when we would go out on patrols, we had coolers and it was, uh, just one of the regular checks that you would do prior to the mission is making sure your coolers are topped off with bottles of water and ice and all of that stuff was accessible to us. And a lot of the times if we were out on a patrol and had a full cooler, what was it for us to give them our drinking water? So it was really no big deal at the end of the patrol to do that. And I'm sure they were grateful. Well, they would utilize the bottles as well. I mean, they, they spared no expense and, and used probably the bottles for quite some time afterwards for many things. And we're such a wasteful society here. We really are. I'll tell you what, that whole freshwater scenario, it, it, that means everybody needs to start building desalinators. Absolutely. <laughs> and that, that's one of the things. And I can I could do a whole show just on the water quality and how we were seeing it raising and uh, rising with the sea levels rising and our uh, water quality is going down. Anyhow, uh, this isn't about that. This is about you, Philip. Philip, now let's talk about Thursday night because there's a reception for your artwork at the Art Center on Veterans Day. Dee Dee, would you like to address that with Philip? I can I can speak. It's it's basically an open to the public exhibition and, and reception for the art of war. Now, um, for many of you that have bought a calendar, thank you very much for your support. The art of war is six additional paintings that nobody has seen yet. Um, so it's an 18 piece show, and it's basically going to be. I think it's from 6:30 to 8 o'clock. Okay, so we'll have some vittles and some wine and some goodies, you know, for people to enjoy while they're there. And um, I think we also have a printed jacle. It's a limited edition jacle of one of the of one of the prints from the calendar. So if you have a calendar, um, I think it's sunrise on the city. Sunrise on the city is what it's called. It's that beautiful sunrise where all it almost looks like a favela of buildings, but. That particular print is on a really nice mat board, Jaclay, and it's actually up for a silent auction as well. And that will be open through the end of the year. Yes, oh, yes. So December 31st. Right. That it's, an, it's a silent auction. We have a board out there that people can raise the bid, raise the bid. And remember, every penny that gets raised goes towards the Veterans Art Program for that particular Jaclay that uh, Philip has donated. Dee Dee, where is the Northport Art Center? What's uh, the 5950 Sam Shapos Way in Northport, Florida. If you go down 41 uh, to the SunTrust Bank, we would be, um, if North you're coming Port south, Port. you'd be turning to the left down Northport Boulevard. Uh, we are across the street from the water plant and the skate park, and we're right beside the um, fire station, and we are at the beginning of Dallas White Park. Yeah, very good. And uh, in Northport Boulevard, if you're coming from the south, you take a ride onto Northport Boulevard, which yes. I come from. And as you go, you go over that little bridge, and it's right to your right. After yes. there's a little bridge there, and you, I always look for that because I know exactly where I'm at then. So uh, I'm really, really grateful and excited because I will be there, Philip. Mm -hmm. I will be there. Then. I'm looking forward to seeing you. I haven't seen you in a while. I know. And you know what? It's a lovely thing to be able to see Philip. And if you want to come and meet Philip, that is the time to come and see not only his artwork, but actually meet our one of the war heroes that we have out there, that he sacrificed a lot. Three tours. Let me tell you, one tour is enough for anybody and we kept on sending people like you, Philip, back and back and back. And how much can a person 
that's been raised in the United States that hasn't been exposed to things like that in their lives, and then you're expected to go out there and defend. Um, you know, I thank you. Thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Um, you know, in, in I fought in Iraq, and a year after I got out of Mosul, which was the second big, biggest city in Iraq, is where I served my third tour. When I got out, a year after it was taken by ISIS. Okay, um, don't know if a lot of my friends that were still there had had come back or not. My unit actually went for a fourth tour after I got out. Um, so I was given the opportunity to be able to send care packages and get with some folks here or back in Illinois and send them care packages to my old unit. But but when you know when I think about it and people ask me, well, how do you feel about serving overseas with it? There were no weapons of mass destruction, you know, and the place where you served from last was overtaken. So so why did you serve? You know, what what justified your, your service over there? And the one thing that I can think of after being out for 10 years and crossing paths with some of the most wonderful people that I've been so terrified to even talk to. Um, the one thing that I can probably express to anybody and everybody that would be curious about why I served or why these people in Afghanistan serve. It, it's for people that have the courage to, to follow their heart and do what they want to do to live as free as they can and be as happy as they can. Very Thank nice. You. Very nice. Thank you. And, and so many of us uh, here don't understand. I've traveled overseas and I've traveled to, uh, I've been in Greece and Turkey. That's the closest I was to Iraq or the Middle East there. But one of the things that I did see is I did see the children in the streets. I did see the uh, people that, um, you know, they lived for begging. I did go to different places that I saw a culture. I learned how to barter. That's one of the things that is just an accept, uh, expected way of doing business over there, that you barter in some of those countries. And I saw how people were very grateful in their families, I, you know, we get this misconception of how people live by what we do see in film or what we do see that the media throws at us. And there are people like us. Maybe their culture is different, but we all have some of the same desires and wants. We want to have the best for our families. And one of the things that I did notice overseas, and I don't know what you saw in Iraq or any of the countries that you've been in, but I saw that they took care of their families from the elderly all the way down. And, yeah. and they made sure that they were taken care of. Here in the U.S., we just kind of get rid of, you know, put them in a nursing home or something like that, where a lot of those countries don't do that. They take care of their people. Yeah, and it's 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 not just immediate family members like uh, you know generations, but it's also siblings as well and cousins as well. It's all a very uh, overwhelming feeling to where they can all get together and be uh, productive for the whole family as a collective unit. Um, I think we used to push our kids out of the nest at eighteen and say good luck, and a lot of them probably would thrive back in the day. I think now it's kind of the the thing is. Um, we're harboring our kids to live with us longer, but not necessarily collectively contribute to the effort, so to speak. Um, but but there would be 20 or 30 people living under one roof. And not only are they sharing everything that they are uh, working for as far as food and everything that they enjoy, but they're working together to build structures together around their whole house. And it's they're just making their house bigger to accommodate for any family that they have. Right. So, Right, exactly. And family, it's a unit. And when they talk about family unit, it's everybody contributing. Let me tell you a quick, a, a funny story. So uh, one day we were patrolling Mosul and we were just having to go door to door and we were just trying to explain to everybody whatever weapon they had, as long as they had a card, this or that. Well, there was a couple of Iraqi troops with us. I was a sergeant and I had an American 
soldier with me and there was an Iraqi sergeant and an Iraqi soldier with him. So the four of us were going door to door in a very nice mannerly way, you know, knocking everything and talking to folks. And so some, some folks invited us in and they brought in a, a plastic table and eggs and croissants and this and that and set it up. And, and so we were like, wow, this is really generous of them. This is really nice. And so their captain comes to the door and says, hi, oh, yeah, 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 shouts a bunch of stuff at him. And the soldier and I were saying, ooh, they're busted. They're sitting <laughs> down on the job, you know. No, but he comes in and sits down and grabs the remote to the TV and just kind of <laughs> him a plate, you know. So that's how they treated the, the locals over there in that specific town. That's how they treated the people that they knew were not there to provoke things, but to make sure that they were okay. And so a lot of times I saw, a lot of grateful, grateful people. That's wonderful. No, were you able to speak the language? I, well, the, the first time I went, um, I trained for two years with a specific group of fellas and then got attached to a different group of fellas and went. So I felt very out of place. I didn't know a whole lot of people. So I spent most of my time with the interpreters. So my first tour was in Baghdad. And so, um, a lot of the interpreters stayed for days or weeks at a time on our base. And so I would hang out with them between missions and learn the language and learn customs and know how to talk to the people. And sometimes there would be missions to where we would go to the interpreter shack to sign out an interpreter and they would all be on patrol somewhere. And I would have to utilize what language I had to, to kind of talk the talk and, and get the mission through. Interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting that you were talking about the culture because that's one of the things that I have seen with us U.S. people, uh, people from the U.S., that we don't take the time to learn the culture of other nations instead of we make judgments and instead of uh, really understanding how other people live and how the culture is of how those people have been raised and and respecting, respect for what they have done or how they live. I, I thought it was amazing during Ramadan that for probably up to three weeks, they would not eat at all, all day long and not drink water at all, all day long. You know, none of them smoked or indulged on any of that all day long. And we were trained and, and taught like, look, don't be out, you know, scarfing down an MRE in front of them knowing that they're not eating all day long. Don't chug a lug a bunch of cold water right in front of them when it's hot outside and they're going through Ramadan. So the fact that, th that they have that devotion to what they believe in to fight through hunger pains instead of stopping by the, by the local McDonald's um, tell, tells a lot about the, the type of people they are for something so primitive as to eating. They all are so excited at the end of the night, you know, when they all eat, they, I mean, they, cut bread together and sit around a big bowl of rice and whatever they're eating. But, but, you know, they all know how dedicated they were all day long to have to sit and wait for what they believe. So I thought that was pretty amazing. And that is amazing. And to be able to witness and, and participate too, to see, see how other people do live. And which brings me back to the art of war, because be, through your experiences, and the trauma because of what you had to go through because of before you said guns firing around you. And uh, are you comfortable about talking about any of that? Sure. Sure. Absolutely. I can talk about anything and everything you want to talk about, my dear. Okay. Well, you only have like three minutes left. So okay. go for it. <laughs> well, uh, um, so basically um, when, when the first thing happened over there, I was very calm, kind of sat through it, no big deal. So the biggest reason why people are affected when they go through trauma repeatedly like this is we are not given the time to to de-escalate our minds and decompress what we just went through. They said, look, some guys got killed yesterday here. You're going to the same place. So get ready. And you're going to go to the same place tomorrow and maybe the same place the next day. So make sure your weapon's nice and clean, get something to eat. And that's how you live. Okay. Um, an instance, I was driving down River Road and I was going to Inglewood and Michelle and I were riding and I was driving my truck and she was riding passenger seat. And so we had the windows down and and we were heading towards Inglewood and it's a 55 mile an hour speed limit. If anybody's been on River Road out there towards Inglewood, it's a two lane road. And the car that passed us backfired very loud 
and um, I blacked out. I couldn't hear anything. Michelle had to take the wheel. She had to basically steer to, to where we couldn't crash. And my first instinct was to reach down and feel for my legs and make sure that my legs were still there. Oh my gosh. Once I found out that everything was okay, I was still crying for a couple hours after that. It was hard for me to drive for a couple days after that, maybe. But uh, but it never goes away. Things don't go away. The 4th of July is not my favorite of holidays, despite it being very festive and, and patriotic. Um, all of the random noises that are going off, my brain tells me, yes, they are fireworks. That's no big deal. But but the back spasms and the involuntary reactions uh, say otherwise. So it's it's very still much a part of my daily living. There's dump truck dumpsters that, that or dumpsters that crash and bang and, and I jump and I'm startled and got to just remember where I'm at. But but talking about it over and over again is something that prolonged exposure was. And that was the main point of it. If you get in a car crash, you're almost getting a car crash. Tell five people about it. You're shaking up. Tell 55 people about it. It's no big deal. Oh, man, Philip, thank you for sharing that, really, because it puts it in perspective for a lot of that, that, uh, and because I know you and Dee, Dee knows you and you're part of our, our world, but it's something that you don't talk about every day. And I, I don't know how, uh, how, and this brings me back to art healing because you're able to express yourself through art to help with the healing. And I don't know if those feelings ever, you know, if it'll ever go away. Uh, it's just like when you lose a friend, when you lose people in your life uh, to any kind of tragedy, tragedy, and I'm sure you've lost some of your fellow uh, soldiers to it. Do you ever get over it? How can you? You move on, but do you move on? I don't know. I, I know. Moving, I think moving on is probably just doing your best and, and for the sake of them. And what would they do if they were here? Right, exactly. I remember on Fort Hood, I was fishing at midnight, and it was the weekend, and they were playing taps. They played taps every min at midnight on Fort Hood. And I was going to stand up and salute, and I said, you know what? My buddy would say, crack, crack another cold one and, and cast the fishing line already. Dee Dee, yes. I know this, this has been harder for uh, than it's been hard. It really is. We appreciate Philip Absolutely. that you are sharing this with us and with the world because there is a lot of people out that, there that will be able to see this and view this. And for any of you, out there that want to be involved with anything, I would suggest that you reach out to Philip and you can reach him at the Northport Art Center. But uh, remember the art of art of war here uh, by Sergeant Philip Moore. There is a reception and a chance to actually meet Philip and to view the artwork and to even buy the calendar this Thursday from 6 to 8.30 at the North Park Art Center, 5950 San Chapos Way in Northport, Florida, 34287. And we look forward to seeing you there. And thank you, Philip, for taking the time and learning how to heal, learning how to share your story, sure. and you. learning how to express yourself and reaching out to fellow people that have gone through similar situations or maybe not as bad or maybe even worse and to give them the opportunity to heal through art. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it. it was it has been a pleasure to all of our to all of our audience out there that has taken the time out of their busy days to tune in, to view our video, whether you are watching us on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, or listening on the radio, WKDW 97.5 FM, Real Community Radio out of Northport, Florida, 
or online at kdwradio.com. Or you can say your smart speaker. I can't say your name because she'll come on. Play WKDW 97.5 FM. You can always listen to us. The show airs on the radio on Wednesday at noon. So in case you want to hear it again, but go ahead and watch us out there. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Thank you you very much. Thank you. And and to you, Dee Dee. I just want to remind everybody, it's 5 o'clock. It's Monday evening that we're doing this. You can cut this out at the end, Marie, but the the Fox News uh, special with Philip will be on soon, so we're going to go out and have a watch party right now. Yeah, and thank you, guys. We'll see you again next week on Collider. Bye. Thank you, Marie.